Welcome to Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government law and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. Two weeks. There must be something significant and suddenly proximate about that span of time since not only English, Fortnite, but Greek, Welsh, Spanish, Romanian, and other languages have a special term for 14 to 15 days, the distance we find ourselves from the midterm elections. After a summer in which the Democrats seemed to be bucking the strong historical trend of the party in the White House's getting clobbered in the midterms, the Republicans have now regained the edge, albeit a narrow one, in the generic ballot. How firm is their slender lead, and what, if anything, can Democrats do to reverse the trend in a fortnight's time? Is there an undercounted margin of Democratic voters motivated by outrage over the Supreme Court's decision overturning Roe v. Wade? And is the abstract but transcendent value of democracy still in voters' minds, particularly with the January 6th committee's recent subpoena of Trump and the DOJ's steady march toward bringing charges in the Mar-a-Lago documents case. And finally, assuming the Republicans do wind up in the driver's seat in at least one House of Congress, what does that portend for our government for the next two years? To catalog these political vibrations and analyze what they mean for the midterms and the American political landscape going forward, we are pleased to welcome three of the most savvy and experienced political commentators in the country. And they are John Alter, an award-winning author, political analyst, documentary filmmaker, columnist, television producer, and radio host. We fact-checked, and indeed, all six of those <laughs> are totally legit. He's also the author of five political books, a former senior editor of Newsweek, and host of Alter Family Politics on Sirius XM, along with his three children. 2020 marked his 10th presidential election covered in print, television, and online. Last year, he launched a newsletter, Old Goats, Ruminating with Friends, that's devoted to conversations with accomplished people of wisdom and experience like John himself. John, thanks very much for returning to Talking Fit. Great to be here, Harry. Greg Sargent, an opinion columnist at the Washington Post covering national politics. He co-writes the Plum Line blog at the Post. Previously, he wrote for Talking Points Memo, New York Magazine, and the New York Observer. His 2018 book, An Uncivil War, Taking Back Our Democracy in an Age of Trumpian Disinformation and Thunderdome Politics. That's such a great phrase, Greg. Thunderdome Politics. I'm just going to say it again explores the deeper roots of our democratic backsliding. Greg Sargent, very nice to welcome you back to Talking Feds. Thanks for having me on. And a first-time guest, though. She has hosted me with great graciousness and sharp questions many times on her own Lincoln Project, Tara Setmeyer, a senior advisor for the Lincoln Project and co-host of The Breakdown on their streaming platform, Prior to joining the Lincoln Project, she was a CNN political commentator and Republican communications director on Capitol Hill. She's a resident scholar at the University of Virginia Center of Politics for the 2022-23 year. And Tyra also narrated the three-part PBS documentary, Dismantling Democracy, for which she received an Emmy nomination in 2020. Thanks for your first trip to Talking Feds. Hope it's not your last. Tara Setmeyer. Thrilled to be here on this side of the conversation. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Turning the tables. All right. Let's start with the midterms, which are quickly approaching only two weeks out. So through the summer, the Democratic Party held on to an advantage, slight but distinct, in the Senate and strong fighting chances in the House. But this week they got unnerving news in the form of a New York Times poll, among other things, that show they seem to have lost four points on the generic ballot to Republicans who now lead that metric, 49 to 45 percent. What happened? Labor Day happened. <laughs> you know, as we know in politics, uh, all of us are veterans of this, and most people do not pay attention in the summer. They pay attention after Labor Day, after the kids have gone back to school, vacations are over, and the onslaught of money 
and advertising, political advertising, all descend on the electorate. And, you know, there were some races over the summer, some, you know, special elections, a couple ballot initiatives like in Kansas and things that kept people paying attention. And I think that there was the obviously the the Dobbs decision, the January 6th committee hearings that made this a bit more of a political summer than normal, other than maybe during a uh, presidential election year. But for midterm, certainly a busy political summer. And Democrats rode the wave of the initial just absolute astonishment and horror of the Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade. And so that was what was at the forefront of the national consciousness for most of the summer. But once that started to fade away a little bit and Republicans got their footing back, then the Republicans got back into their form and have been hammering Democrats on the issues of crime, inflation, immigration, culture wars, depending on where you are. But they are lockstep nationalizing this election and staying on message, where I think Democrats have coalesced around the abortion issue, but didn't really capitalize on the accomplishments of the Biden administration, which there are plenty of, particularly on the economic side of things. I mean, they passed the bill and signed into law the Inflation Reduction Act. Whether it reduces inflation or not, that was something they could have coalesced messaging-wise. It was easy for people to understand. It was active. And they seem to have not found their footing there to combat the Republicans who are still hammering away on inflation. And we know that kitchen table issues, it's the economy stupid, that will always, always, always be what's at top of mind for people because that's what impacts them every day. So I think it's been a combination of a lot of things that have shifted this momentum a little bit and Democrats need to get it together. They only have a couple of weeks. Well, I, I guess the problem with the Inflation Reduction Act is that it hasn't reduced inflation. You know, so it sounds nice. Picky, picky. (laughs) You know, if you're a voter who is just tuning in, as I think Tara rightly described, what you know is what you see at the supermarket and when you're buying gas. So then you get a kind of a reversion to the mean. And normally in midterm elections, they go against the party that controls the White House. There are only two exceptions in the first midterms of a president in the last 100 years, 1934 and 2002, and in all of the others, the party that held the White House lost ground in Congress in the first midterms. Now, I never thought that that history was determinative and was going to mean it was going to be some kind of a huge red wave. I thought the red wave stuff was unmerited when you heard about that earlier in the year. It was always going to be a close election. But at the same time, this idea that abortion and reaction to the Dobbs decision was going to solve all the Democrats' problems was never realistic since the economy is is always going to be number one for people. Now, does that mean that we're back into possible red wave territory? I don't think so. But I do think it makes it very hard for the Democrats to hold the House of Representatives. Greg, you had a really interesting op-ed a couple of days ago, what happened to the anti-Trump coalition, basically positing that the Trump forces have stayed united and together, as Tara suggests, but the other side that put together better results you know, in 2020 has frayed. Can you just elaborate on that? What's the nature of the fraying? And is it issues driven or is it also, as Tara says, a matter of better national discipline for the R's in their messaging? Okay, so I think we have to remember that the most vulnerable Democrats right now are the ones who were elected in the 2018 wave when Trump was in the White House. By definition, these people are going to be extremely vulnerable. They were elected in parts of the country where Democrats are not supposed to win, outering suburbs, exurbs, even districts reaching into rural areas in places like Southern Virginia. Abigail Spanberger is a very good example of this. This is the toughest race any of these people have ever faced in their lives. 2018 was a wave, as I just said. And 2020, Trump was still president, and the uh, Democratic base was motivated. It was an anti-MAGA majority that came out to the polls in 2020. And even there, you already started to see that coalition fray, because keep in mind that the anti-MAGA majority coalition did produce 81 million votes against Trump to get him out. But 12 or so, maybe a dozen House Democrats lost their seats precisely because for 
a lot of these voters who were alienated by Trump, they didn't translate that in their heads to a vote for a Democrat for Congress when they had the chance to vote against Trump and vote for a congressional candidate as well. In fact, in that case, they voted for Republicans precisely in order to have a counterbalance in Congress to what they expected would be a Democratic presidency. And so now with Trump gone, I think that fraying is actually getting more pronounced, especially with inflation. I had an interesting conversation with Democratic strategist Dan Senna, who ran the DCCC during the 2018 wave and who knows this stuff in and out. He said you have a kind of a toxic combination where a lot of the voters in the very places where they're not going to be inclined to vote Democratic, like outer ring suburbs, ex-serbs and so forth, also have to drive a long way a lot of the time. So gas prices hit them particularly hard. Now, look, it's deeply crazy that Democrats should be held responsible for higher gas prices, but it is what it is, right? I mean, it's a worldwide phenomenon, but yeah. But they don't explain it. They don't explain it to people. So they don't know that. They just assume that, well, you're in charge, you're responsible for it. Same thing with inflation. It's not going to turn. You can't just snap your fingers and inflation is going to change tomorrow. Right. And that's the third, that's the third leg of this, right? So it's in really tough parts of the country without Trump ballot anymore. They get clobbered really hard by inflation and gas prices. And then on top of that, what you just said. I just want to reinforce with one quick datum what Greg's saying that's in the poll. How about this? Women independent voters went from favoring Democrats by 14 points last month to now favoring Republicans by 18 points. So when I first saw that, Harry, when I first saw that New York Times Senate poll, I, I thought it has to be an outlier because yeah. there's been a gender gap in this country for 60 years. Where women are more in favor of the Democrats. You mean. Yes, it became pronounced yeah. about 30 years ago. So I just thought this was some kind of outlier. But then Monmouth did a poll, another reputable pollster, and it basically replicated that. And Monmouth found that these women, independent and Republican women who had voted Democratic in the past and were now going back to the Republicans, they felt that Joe Biden had not explained his plan for inflation to them. Tara is nodding vigorously on this. And yeah. there's time for him to do that. I think what happened to the Democrats in the last few weeks is that they were putting all their chips on abortion. They were taking steps to try to hold inflation down a little bit with things like filling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, but they weren't explaining inflation to the American public. And they just got some really powerful ammunition this week from Katie Porter, who in a hearing on Capitol Hill, she heard testimony that profiteering, price gouging by American corporations is responsible for half of all of the inflation. And if the Democrats can try to explain that to the American public in the next couple of weeks, and explain that if the Republicans get back in, they are in bed with these corporations, want to do favors for these corporations, and that the only way to keep some progress going against inflation is to let the Democrats, who are generally the party wanting to check corporate America, give them another chance to do so. Absolutely. Democrats need to embrace that they are the adult in the room governing. We're working for you. This is what we have done. We acknowledge the difficulties and economic hardships people are experiencing every day. Acknowledge that. You have to have that acknowledgement so people think you're listening to them, which I hope that they are. I mean, Democrats should be listening. But they need to explain and show the contrast. While we are actively working to govern and fix these problems, Republicans are obstructing they're in bed with the corporations who are the ones responsible for this. You know, help us help you, <laughs> you know, figure out they have to find a way to simplify the messaging. Republicans, I spent 27 years with the Republicans as a political communications expert in various capacities, including seven years in Capitol Hill. I know the playbook here. I know of what I speak and um, not no longer a Republican. Many, many know that I left the party in 2020 after Trump refused to concede the election. And I saw that Republicans were going along with this nonsense. I said, that's it. I'm out. But I still understand how they operate and the communications apparatus. They keep it simple and they repeat it. They define the villain 
And it doesn't matter where that election is. My good friend, Michael Steele, who I don't know if he's been a guest on your program before, but if sure. not, oh, yeah. you got to bring him on. Michael's the best. I've known Michael for decades. And when he was RNC chairman in 2010, the last time Republicans had a wave election, if you want to call it that, the Tea Party and the like in the midterms, then the villain was Nancy Pelosi. It didn't matter what else was going on. She was the villain. They tied Nancy Pelosi to everything. The Republicans are still freaking doing this. Nancy Pelosi is still the villain, for goodness sakes. You know, I live in Northern Virginia. I see these advertisements in the swing districts up here. And it's so-and-so voted with Nancy Pelosi 90% of the time. She's right. still the villain. So Democrats have not had an equivalent on the other side of who the villains are and nationalize that message. And there, there are plenty of candidates, right? There's plenty of them. <laughs> <laughs> Let me follow up on one adult in the room aspect, because it's tricky, it strikes me. So in the summer wave, it seemed as if Democrats were motivated by the abortion decision, yes, by gun control and by the democracy issue. And now we think the Republicans are riding a wave consisting of immigration, crime and inflation. But this democracy issue, I think, for many of us seems as real as can be. And, John, you had a um, tweet suggesting that Dems should try to ride it. But is that the kind of, you know, arcane graduate school value that just can't compete against high gas prices? It's never in my lifetime been so acute, but is it possible to actually make it drive turnout and votes? So you have to distinguish between turnout and votes. Okay, so democracy yep. is not a voting issue, meaning it doesn't mobilize large numbers of what they call sporadic voters who don't vote usually in midterms. It doesn't mobilize those voters by itself. But what it does do is it mobilizes Democratic volunteers, Democrats who are willing to stop ringing their hands and start ringing doorbells. And they need an army. The largest army there's ever been is 1 million in the 2008 Obama campaign, mm -hmm. 1 million ground troops for Democrats. They're not gonna get to that this year, but the closer they get to that number, the better chance they have because midterms are always turnout elections. Yeah, that's right. So democracy is a great issue for getting volunteers out there in the next couple of weeks, people to use the call tools where they can call into other states and if they can get a better than expected turnout, and by the way, the early voting in Georgia suggests the turnout is going to be more like 2018 than 2014 when nobody showed up and the Democrats got clobbered. So they need that big turnout and democracy is a very important piece of this. But the idea of kind of ignoring inflation and saying, oh, if we don't talk about it, people will vote on abortion. That strategy has failed. They need to go right at inflation, but blame it on corporate America. Well, I was just going to point out a couple things about all this. One is that in 2018 and 2020, Trump was the villain, right? And, you know, for us, Trump is still a villain because we're paying very close attention to the threat that he and his movement continue to pose. But I think for a lot of less engaged voters, in 2018 and 2020, you had that kind of big orange face screaming at you all the time with all sorts of deranged tweets day in and day out. And it was a really, I think, a very telling thing when large groups of Democratic voters would show up at the airports to argue against the Muslim ban. That was, to me, a sign very early that we were seeing an uncommon level of energy, political energy on the ground during a uh, midterm election. Remember, in 2018, it was historically high turnout for a midterm. So the code can be cracked in a midterm. You just need that villain. And look, Nancy Pelosi and Liz Cheney and the January 6th committee have, have done a very good job of dramatizing the threat. But on some level, unless you've just got that guy in the White House just shrieking in your face with all sorts of obscenities and racism and misogyny, you know, it's a bit sad to think that that's what it takes, but I fear that it is. But there is another villain, and that's the Supreme Court. That's and true. it's a pretty good villain for the Democrats 
this year. And before everybody on the Democratic side gets all depressed about the outcome, you know, we don't know what the power of the Dobbs decision is going to be. And yeah. there's some indications from some special elections that it could be very significant. And you could have large numbers of what I call, and in the trade is called sporadic voters, people who don't normally vote in midterm elections, especially women, but also including a lot of younger men yeah. who are concerned about getting their girlfriends pregnant, they are going to show up. And if that happens, it's going to be a very close election. Can I ask, I'd love to throw something out there for discussion. I talked to Pat Ryan after his surprise victory in the Hudson Valley. Remember, he outperformed polls and, and turnout was a big part of this. And that was when I think think anxiety over Roe was kind of at full boil. And what he said to me was interesting. He said, on the ground, democracy absolutely is a galvanizing issue. And I wonder if what it took to make democracy a galvanizing issue was the overturning of Roe, the deprivation of rights for, for millions and millions of people. Maybe voters connected that in their minds to the need to get out and vote to protect those rights. Yeah, the idea of freedom, I think, was really yes. what was front and center there. And because never in history have we actually lost a right. It's always usually affirming a right or creating one. But taking one away, I think, jolted a lot of people into a reality they never thought they would face here in the United States of America in 2022, especially for women, which is over half the population. I think that as we get further away from that, though, that the Democrats didn't do a great job of keeping that all together in a very easily digestible way. I'll say, keep repeating that because the attention span of the American electorate is very short, unfortunately. We know this. They're only going to digest so much. And if you cannot put it in terms that are in your face, this is how it impacts your life every day. This is how it will impact your kids' lives every day. This is why you should care because it matters now. The idea of losing democracy is such an esoteric concept to a lot of people. A lot of people don't understand what our constitutional republic slash democracy actually is, how it functions. I fault the lack of civic education in this country for that. I think it's a travesty. But if people don't understand why they should be fighting for it or what it means if you lose it, then they're not going to be motivated by it to fight for it. You know, that's why at the Lincoln Project, we do what we do, why we try to constantly focus on every single issue that's important, but it doesn't matter if you don't have a democracy and the freedom to vote, the freedom to make those choices, the freedom to choose the government in the manner in which it was intended. None of those issues are going to matter if we don't have that anymore. Economic prosperity, all of those things will not matter if you have an autocracy and you lose your democracy. So we try to incorporate that in everything that we do at the Lincoln Project so that there is a through line because people need to understand it. I frankly don't believe enough Americans see the threat to democracy for what it really is. And that's, I think, something that we have to continue to hammer home no matter what. Mary, can I just say something about that threat since you have so many lawyers who are listening? You know, people talk about the responsibility of journalists to raise the alarm on this. I think lawyers in the United States who understand that democracy is at risk, they have a huge responsibility now and a huge opportunity to bring complaints before bar organizations about people who harass election officials. It was just a Reuters story about this is going on in Nevada, in Reno, a big county in Nevada, where this guy not only accused the election commissioner of treason, but got a lot of people to you know, threaten her. And this guy should be sued and when there are lawyers involved, as there are not just in the 2020 election, but going forward, who are acting in anti-democratic fashion, they should be disbarred. But to do that, you need lawyers who are listening to bring complaints against them and to be enlisted in what I think is the struggle of our generation, which is to protect our democracy. Harry, I have a question for you, since I'm a non-lawyer here, and I think that's an excellent point that Jonathan has brought up, because... I think as much as people give lawyers a lot of shit, right, but the people still <laughs> respect the law profession overall. And the idea of lawyers being sanctioned for being reckless and irresponsible and not living up to the, the ethical standards lawyers are supposed to be held to in this type of environment, I think would have an impact. Like you see Rudy Giuliani 
being suspended or potentially losing his law license. And the idea of losing a law license, I think, shows that there is a peer-reviewed, recognized disciplinary action against people who are abusing their profession here and their licensing, like a medical doctor. If you lose your medical license, people go, oh my God, you know, you've done something really wrong. So I think that there's some merit to that. I think the impression of people being disciplined for putting forward things that are against our democracy or a threat to democracy or not doing their sworn duty to uphold the law and actually working against the Constitution, I think that would have an impact. Do you? Yeah, so I I think it's a really good point. And one way of defining, or at least one of the fundaments of Trumpism, is this notion that people can just lie with impunity and in the public square, and it doesn't matter. And by and large, I mean, we are seeing it now. He was deposed twice this month. People in general, once you actually are getting into the sort of crucible of the legal system where when they lie, there's perjury charges, you're actually changing behavior. And what you're what you're talking about and John is talking about is a soft. Well, it's it's soft in the sense that it's bar figures and not judges, but it's very serious because people can lose their livelihoods to see The system have purchase and actually exact a price, I think, is very not just satisfying, but sobering, hopefully, for the whole gang. It's now time for our sidebar feature in which we explain an important term in the law. And this week, we are going to be discussing the different terms that often are mushed together when we talk about the presidential grant of mercy to someone who's been convicted or indicted. And those terms are pardons, commutation, clemency. What do they mean and what are the differences among them? And to tell us, we're really thrilled to welcome Estelle Parsons. Estelle is an actress, singer, and stage director. After studying law, she became a singer before moving on to work for the Today Show and starting a heralded Broadway and film career. She has directed numerous Broadway productions and was well known for her role as Beverly Harris in Roseanne and the Connors. She has been awarded the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress and been nominated another time and she has been nominated for five Tonys. Estelle was inducted into the American Theater Hall of Fame in 2004. I give you Estelle Parsons on the President's Clemency Powers. The Constitution gives the President the, quote, power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment, close quote. That power takes several different forms, and accounts of presidential grants of mercy refer to various terms, including clemency, pardons, and commutation. What do those terms mean, and how are they different? Clemency, or executive clemency, is the general power of a president or governor or king in English common law to dispense mercy or forgiveness to those convicted of crimes. The concept of clemency covers several different acts, pardons, amnesties, commutations of sentence, remission of fines and restitution, and reprieves. In Federalist number 74, Alexander Hamilton explained the necessity of this clemency power, and I quote, The criminal code of every country partakes so much of necessary severity that without an easy access to exceptions in favor of unfortunate guilt, justice would wear a countenance too sanguinary and cruel. That's the end of the quote. The most frequent and familiar exercise of the president's clemency power is a pardon. Pardons are a complete forgiveness of the crime. They wipe out all punishment and consequences of the offense. For example, President Trump provided a full pardon for Steve Bannon, who had been indicted for defrauding people and donating to a charitable organization that would build a border wall with Mexico. Pardons also can be issued prior to conviction or even indictment 
in which case they preclude the government from prosecuting the beneficiary of the pardon. By the terms of the Constitution, pardons are available for all crimes except impeachment, but notably only extend to offenses against the United States. This means the president does not have the power to pardon state crimes. Pardons can be extended to a class of people, in which case they are referred to as a general pardon or an amnesty. Amnesties were issued by Andrew Jackson after the Civil War and by Ronald Reagan to undocumented immigrants as part of the Immigration Reform Act of 1986. A commutation of sentence is the power of the executive to substitute a lesser sentence for the one imposed on the individual. It does not wipe out the conviction, but does relieve the individual of specific consequences. Frequently, this takes the form of commuting the remainder of a convicted individual's sentence, immediately freeing them from incarceration. Finally, a reprieve is a temporary delay in imposing punishment, usually given to allow the executive to study the individual's case. For Talking Feds, I'm Estelle Parsons. Thank you very much, Estelle Parsons, for explaining presidential clemency. This sidebar actually came about through Estelle's work in the play Reentry, Actors Playing Jazz, directed by Estelle Parsons and developed in the Actors Studio in New York, the story of six formerly incarcerated men who have come together after release from prison to start a theater group with a goal to keep them on the right side of the law. Here's what Alec Baldwin had to say about it. Thrilling, better than anything on Broadway. It's still touring the country and Estelle is still directing it. Thank you again, Estelle Parsons. All right, it is now time for a spirited debate brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thank you, Harry. In today's spirited debate, we dig up the dirt on the agave plant to find out the difference between tequila and mezcal. So first things first. Tequila is a type of mezcal, much like bourbon is a type of whiskey. In general, tequilas are mezcals, but not all mezcals are tequilas. Allow me to explain. Tequila can only come from the blue agave plant in specific regions of Mexico, like the region of Jalisco, where the city of tequila is located. No coincidence there. Mezcal, however, can be made from many varieties of agave, specifically from the heart of the agave, known as the piña. The distillery process for tequila and mezcal is also different. Tequila is produced by steaming the blue agave and then distilling it in copper stills for a toasty, clean taste. On the other hand, mezcal, which appropriately means oven-cooked agave, is cooked in earthen pits with wood and charcoal before being distilled in clay pots. No wonder mezcal, which is typically consumed straight, has more of a smoky, earthy taste Of course, the best way to get to know the differences between tequila and mezcal is to pick up a bottle of each from your Total Wine & More and pour hundreds of years of tradition right into your glass. Cheers! Thanks to our friends at Total Wine & More for today's A Spirited Debate. I'd like to switch directions and just talk a little bit about some of the individual races, especially in the Senate, where the dynamics of individual races, because there's only some 33 in play, can be more important than the generic numbers. So start with Pennsylvania and Georgia. What the hell? (laughs) Two Republican candidates who, you know, are so not ready for prime time and on this democracy metric and many others shouldn't be permitted in Washington, D.C., much less in the Senate chambers are, you know, really within striking distance of Fetterman and Warnock, respectively. Of course, I'm talking about Dr. Oz and Herschel Walker. Where do those races stand at this point? 
I think the big thing in Pennsylvania is going to be this debate next week. Uh, uh-huh. Just one debate. Fetterman's health issue has kind of uh, been a real concern for a lot of voters. You can understand that, even though he got a very good report from his doctor this week. So fortunately for Fetterman, expectations for him are fairly low. And if he goes in against a polished television performer like Dr. Oz and holds his own and doesn't seem to be impaired, I I think he's going to be in pretty reasonable shape in that race because he's so obviously actually a Pennsylvanian. And and he's done a very effective job of making Dr. Oz seem like he's from New Jersey. And, And he pounds at it in imaginative ways. He's used social media very effectively. Very clever campaign from the start. So even though he's not actually a good debater, and in the past, Fetterman has really been lousy in debates, the bar is so low now that I think things are looking pretty good for him. Although everybody is going to be parsing his words and his sentences. So if he does what all of these politicians do and has incomplete sentences or stumbles a little bit, or talks like you know, a little bit like Herschel Walker, not being able to put three words together, Fetterman will get hammered for that. In Georgia, I really think the big problem that people aren't recognizing is that for Warnock to win, you have to have a large number of ticket splitters because Kemp is crushing Stacey Abrams right now. And so for people to go, okay, I'm for Kemp, but I'm also for Warnock, ticket splitting at that level has not been very common in recent years. And actually, that factor helps Fetterman in Pennsylvania because Josh Shapiro is so far ahead of Doug Mastriano for governor. But Walker may slide in on Kemp's coattails. I have some thoughts. <clears throat> so, <laughs> no, really? <laughs> I have some thoughts. Well, on we've this. got some airtime. Go yes, for it. Yes. What a nice confluence. As a very proud Jersey girl who is a uh, transplant now, I mean, but I'm always a Jersey girl. My family still lives there. And we don't want Oz either. She so, says with like, her New York Giants hat. <laughs> yes, proudly, proudly. Yeah. We're having a great season finally. And so, yeah, I mean, we don't want Oz either. But that idea of him being this carpetbagger was a great way for Fetterman to keep people engaged over the summer when, like I said, it's pretty much the political doldrums. And I spend time down the shore in Jersey. And so I saw the idea of them hiring the banners to fly down the shore, making fun of Oz, (laughs) being from New Jersey, you know, because a lot of folks from Philadelphia come down the shore to Jersey. and, And so they see that. It was brilliant. Getting the Jersey Shore personalities to troll him on Cameo. I mean, brilliant stuff. But they didn't keep that momentum up. And the health issue, even though Oz, as a doctor, should know better than to, you know, health shame anyone who's had a stroke. Well, but he's a he's a doctor. But yeah, yeah no kidding, a doctor who's apparently a puppy killer too. But yeah. you know, anyway, but shaming him, I think, got people's attention because it refocused folks back on Fetterman's health, since he's literally been off the campaign trail most of the summer, yeah. recovering. Yeah. But even though it was really underhanded. But these are campaigns. People are going to do what they want. And he got the result, even though some folks said, well, isn't that kind of cruel? You're a doctor. You shouldn't be shaming anyone for their health. And so there was some question about that. Would it backfire? But it got people talking about his health, which is not what they wanted. It's not what the Fetterman campaign wanted. They wanted to talk about Oz being from Jersey and being a puppy killer and being a fake doctor and full of shit and not from Pennsylvania and not really having Pennsylvanians needs at the forefront. It's about his own celebrity. So they've lost the control of the narrative a little bit. So to Jonathan's point, this debate is really important for Fetterman. And I think that he needs to lean into it. If I were advising him, he should lean into his recovery. He should be very transparent about what his health records say and that stroke victims are very prevalent in this country. This is something every average American can relate to and turn it around, lean into it and make Oz look like the ass that he is for going after him on this. It's clear that Fetterman is competent to do the job. He's been an old statewide elected official. He was a mayor. He has experience. He's really a Pennsylvanian through and through uh, compared to this guy. You know, who do you think has the best interest of Pennsylvania at heart here? And Pennsylvania does have a, a history of ticket splitting. So we'll see what happens there. Now, Georgia, 
Listen, I am baffled every day that Herschel Walker even has a shot in this election. And I think that that just speaks volumes about the impact of negative partisanship, about the fact that the Republican Party just will elect anyone just to have that vote in the Senate, which I think is just such a further example of how far the, the party has fallen. Because I remember when candidate quality mattered and Herschel Walker never would have had a shot in hell of winning a Senate primary in an important state like Georgia. It's just infuriating to watch and sad, in my opinion. And Herschel Walker is a disgrace in every sense of the word. And he doesn't belong near anyone's Senate office. He should be in a medical office getting treatment for his problems. So Warnock, I don't think, did himself any favors at that debate by letting Herschel Walker go on offense, even though it was nonsense a lot of the times. Voters want someone who is a confident fighter. And even if you're confident in your crazy, people respond to that. They don't like people on the defense that are defensive all the time. I say this as a football fan. No, it's he, totally he, true. Like Demings the other day, even though- That debate has been overanalyzed. There, there was an Atlanta Braves game going on, a playoff game going on. Almost nobody in Georgia saw that debate live. But so they saw the, the clips, clips though. I, I don't think that debate had much of an impact. He did purposely play it, not going after Walker on the floor. That was a decision. Which I thought was a huge mistake. Like I said, defense wins games and championships, but offense wins elections. And when you go on offense and you have your opponent on defense from the very beginning, which is what Walker did, it doesn't matter who's watching live. We all know the kind of society we live in. Most people aren't watching a debate at seven o'clock on a Friday night. They watch the clips on their phone. Yeah. So I think that was a mistake on Warnock's part not to go on offense against Walker. So I, it's a tough, that's going to be tough. He did, he did call him a liar in the debate. Not enough. He should have called mm. him a liar every mm. single time. And, mm. and that's why you're just, you're unqualified to be the senator from the state of Georgia every single time. I think he's closing the gap because of the generic improvement in the Republicans' fortunes nationally. Warnock is still up a few points. Let me just add, by the way, a completely straight comment on your reference to the Jersey Shore, which is I just <laughs> finished the Springsteen memoir, which in the first half is all about the Jersey Shore. It is really good. And he wrote it himself. I was really impressed. Sorry. It's one of my favorite places on, on earth. We now return to your <laughs> normally scheduled programming, Greg. Well, I'm going to keep it focused on Jersey for a sec. Yeah. Um, right. As someone who grew up in New York with a view of Jersey uh, from Manhattan, I can tell you nobody can troll like Jersey people can. So, <laughs> uh, I want to agree with Tara on Georgia. I think if you want the electorate to understand your opponent's negatives, you got to point the camera at them. And the way to point the camera at them is to point at those negatives yourself. And I think it was a strange decision to be, quote unquote, above the fray. Yeah. What does that mean to anybody? Politics is a tough game. People want fighters for them. You know, above the fray doesn't say anything to anyone, in my view. So, yes, about Fetterman, to add up to what you guys said, I think there's a way to put a bunch of it together in the following way. Right. So it's obviously true that that Fetterman's health vulnerabilities are in some sense going to play as a positive. Right. A lot of people in Pennsylvania are struggling with chronic injuries from workplace accidents, illness, and so forth. You know, it's a hard-bitten state in, in many parts of it. And if Fetterman can outperform at the debate and surprise people in spite of his health problems, the health stuff becomes an even bigger positive. I mean, people are really suckers for a comeback story. If Fetterman can kind of leverage his condition to turn himself into a bit of an underdog and then surprise people. I think that could be very powerful. In Pennsylvania, by the way, that is his legacy. He became mayor for many years of Braddock, where my whole family is from. But that is, if you want to talk Jersey, kind of the Camden, New Jersey mm -hmm. of Pennsylvania, really godforsaken place. And he did tremendous yeah. heavy lifting to bring it back. And he needs to focus that. Yeah. I remember talking to a Pennsylvania Democrat about this years ago. I mean, he's been looking at statewide office for a while. Yeah. And years ago, a Pennsylvania Democrat said his name recognition in the western part of the state is shocking to operatives. I mean, earned. That's the point. It's earned. It's not through celebrity or any bullshit like that. It's through busting your ass to help people under really difficult circumstances. And I think people can see that in his face and in his demeanor. Yeah, I mean, I think he's an unusual Democrat who can really appeal to Trump's base in a way that so few can. Let's do this as a closeout. 
So, you know, swallowing hard and accepting the prospect of a Republican takeover of one or both houses in Congress. And by the way, here was a kind of harrowing datum. The odds of Republicans taking both are slightly higher than the Dems holding on just to the Senate. So the Republicans take over at least the House. What does that portend? What are we looking at for the next couple years in the politics and policy of this country? You're looking at endless, endless investigations. Like I said earlier, the Republicans are uninterested in actually governing. It's become a grievance, social media, owning the libs, trolling operation that has yet to put forth an actual agenda of what they will do for this country. What they have shown us is that they're willing to compromise democracy. They're willing to take illiberal, authoritarian steps to accomplish that power grab. And Kevin McCarthy, I'm still skeptical whether he actually becomes the speaker. That's a great. Elaborate there, please. Yeah, I've said this for over a year now that I will be very surprised if Kevin McCarthy ever actually has the gavel, that the increase in MAGA candidates, I mean, you have 299 election deniers currently running for office in this country, many of them for Congress, and many of them may get elected. And depending on how large that margin of victory is, depends on how much power the Marjorie Taylor Greene wing of the party, which is growing exponentially. There's a reason why Kevin McCarthy had Marjorie Taylor Greene, who should be an absolute absolute outlier. She should be shunned for her antics, her racism, her anti-Semitism, and her conspiracy theory nonsense. But she was embraced by Kevin McCarthy when he rolled out the new commitment to America. She was by his side. Why? Because he needs that wing of the, of the party to vote for him to be speaker. I firmly believe Donald Trump is sitting back waiting to fully embarrass Kevin McCarthy when he can, he's going to pull the rug out from under him because Kevin has not been sufficiently loyal enough, despite how he has debased himself with Trump over the years. Trump does not forget what Kevin McCarthy said about him after January 6th. He never forgets those things and doesn't feel he's been sufficiently loyal. He gets off on the idea of humiliating people, and he's just waiting to do that for Kevin McCarthy. So you have others that are waiting in the wings to take McCarthy out as well, depending on how many MAGAs are elected into the Congress. So you're not going to see anything good coming out of a Republican-controlled Congress. You'll have Jim Jordan and all the rest of them. You think Benghazi was bad? Wait, Hunter Biden's laptop and Joe Biden will be impeached. They'll go after Merrick Garland. It's not going to be a pretty couple of years with Republicans in the Congress. God help us. So I would just say I agree with that, Tara. But one ironic point that historians will note is that if Kevin McCarthy hadn't gone to Mar-a-Lago right after impeachment and made up to Trump and kissed his ass, as Trump says, J.D. Vance does, Trump would have been finished. That's right. Mitch McConnell had just given a speech after impeachment saying that he should be prosecuted. If you listen closely to the speech and if Kevin McCarthy had just said, we're done with him, we're moving on, it would have been all over. That's right. That was a historic, disastrous the stake for the whole world. I agree with your basic analysis, but I think it redounds to the benefit of the Democrats for 2024. Jim Jordan is not an appealing character. Marjorie Taylor Greene is not appealing, and it will help the Democrats. They were not going to get any legislation through if Republicans took control anyway. And the only real issue on the Senate side is if they can hang on, say they pick up Pennsylvania, even if they lose Nevada, and they still have a 50-50 majority. If they can hang on, they can confirm judges. If they lose the Senate, then they won't get any judges through. So really, in some ways, the whole election nationally is just about whether Democrats will be able to continue to appoint judges. Just to build on all this stuff, I'm about to post a piece on this, on the likelihood of debt ceiling chaos. Mm -hmm. And I think a really important reason that we're going to see debt ceiling chaos is exactly what we're talking about here. You may remember that Trump described Kevin McCarthy as my Kevin, and he meant that, right? And so unlike McConnell, whose power base in the Senate does not rely in any way on Trump, McCarthy made the decision that the only way he was ever going to become speaker was if he could mobilize the Trump constituency behind a Republican House takeover. And so he's forever indebted to Trump. And remember, 
Robert Draper's book tells us that Kevin McCarthy actually feared that Trump's supporters were going to kill him. That's right. Right. Justifiably. He spent the next 20 months helping Trump cover up what had happened. So, Greg, can I ask you a question about your debt ceiling reporting? Yeah. Why aren't the Democrats planning in the lame duck session to pass a debt ceiling increase that will take us past the 2024 election? Well, that's what my piece that's going up very soon is all about. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. Now, I don't know. I don't know whether they're going to do that or not. There's a new push for it, which is what I'm reporting on. And there are various ways you could do it. You could actually do more than just extend the debt ceiling up to a level that it'll never reach under Biden. You could also create some sort of formula, like saying something like, you know, the debt ceiling will be 20 times the amount spent on these 10 major agencies. Then you don't have to put a hard number on it. Why would they not do this? I mean, do they want to have another 2011 where... They played chicken with the full faith and credit of the United States. But it's worse than that, right? I mean, that's the thing. It's going to be worse. Remember, Trump attacked McConnell when McConnell caved last year on the debt limit. That's right. So why isn't this a no-brainer? The next election is not for two years. They won't pay that much of a political price for doing this. I don't get why this isn't definitely on tap to be done in late November or December. Well, I can tell you this, that if the shoe were on the other foot, there is no question in my mind Republicans would do this. Republicans have been cutthroat when it comes to pushing forward legislation they want, not really worrying about what the other side thinks, feels, what the precedent is. Mitch McConnell is a brilliant tactician in that respect, and he got everything he wanted when he was Senate Majority Leader. And I don't understand why Democrats aren't more aggressive that way. Greg, what's the argument against it? I don't want you to spoil your piece, but what is the argument in the Democratic Party against using the lame duck session to put this ridiculous issue out of its misery? So trying to think of it from their point of view, I can think of only two. The lame duck calendar is going to be very crowded. There's a lot of must pass stuff to do. Got to fix the Electoral Count Act to guard against the next coup. The other thing is, let's face it, a bunch of moderates aren't going to want to vote on a higher debt ceiling which strikes me as insanely short-sighted, right? I mean, if you're worried about politics, you really should worry a lot more about Republicans trying to melt down the economy heading into 2024 than you should about some obscure vote on something that nobody understands. Because in 2024, they'll run on the recession that was caused as a result of it and blame Biden for it instead of them when they were actually the ones who did it. So there's every motivation to do it. It's cynical. I was just utterly shocked to read in Politico the other day that the White House thinks that McCarthy will cave on aid to Ukraine because they'll be afraid of the political blowback if Ukraine loses. And I'm like, have you been paying attention for (laughs) the last 10 years? Good Lord. All right. So stay tuned. And by now, actually, Greg Sargent's uh, op-ed, you can see it in the Washington Post. Let's just take a couple minutes. It's all we've got on the figure who's kind of been hovering over all of this. A lot happened with respect to him this week, the former president. And I just want to know if anyone has thoughts, probably by the time we air this on Monday, the subpoena from the January 6th committee will have dropped. Will that be the end of the line or will there actually be some litigation and battle joined in the courts over this? It's shadow boxing. There's not enough time. Jamie Raskin admitted it. There's not enough time to actually you know, deal with this subpoena. And I, I think it was a stunt that they pulled just to end with a bang instead of a whimper. They had a tremendous run, nine fantastic hearings. But the subpoena is not meaningful. There are, however, a lot of other things going on. Trump just got slapped down by Judge Carter again this mm-hmm. week. He's he's in a and world Judge of Deary. legal hurt. People are yeah. so intimidated by him that they're not rationally looking at how much trouble he's in. That's another thing. I don't understand why more people aren't continuing to point out the fact that Donald Trump is under all of these 
legal peril that he's in County. and making a point of it. Yeah. I mean, it's at state level, local, federal, defamation, criminal, national security. I mean, it's beyond me why this isn't pointed out more. We're treating this guy as if he's some normal former president that forgot to pay a couple taxes or something or return a couple documents that he used for his biography. Like, I don't understand why this isn't more of a focus because what Donald Trump has done is really egregious on a number of levels from the E. Jean Carroll case down down, all the way down to what's happening in Mar-a-Lago. I mean, we just found out again, recently reported, that some of those highly classified documents contained really important intelligence information concerning Iran and China and, you know, nuclear secrets. Like, what are we doing? Yeah, I, it's yeah. just, it, it baffles me about this. But as far as the Trump subpoena on January 6th, yes, I agree with Jonathan that it's meaningless really in the greater scheme of things because he's never going to testify and they're not going to enforce it. But it was a good way to put an exclamation point on the fantastic, very alarming, very illuminating series of committee hearings that they had that should make Donald Trump a pariah and everyone who enabled him for the rest of, of American history. And yet here we are. Yeah. In fact, I think it actually is somewhat helpful in that way that you just discussed, right? Because now there's no way Trump can say something like, you know, it was a one-sided sham hoax. Democrats can immediately counter, well, you were invited to testify and give your side of it. Mm -hmm. I think we are unanimous here, and that is what it's about. And to John's point, even if Trump wants to fight it, the whole thing just expires at the end of the Congress, so it becomes moot anyway. Most importantly here, though, is will he be held accountable for something? You know, something. It needs to be something. And I think, by the way, that's the answer to your question. He's getting a world of hurt. I think the New York AG case and the defamation case, he'll have to write big checks. But what people are saying is they still perceive him to have run through the raindrops unless and until criminal charges come down. But I personally think they are coming, both in Fulton County and at DOJ. But stay tuned for that. We got one minute or so left for our Talking Five feature, where we take a question from a listener and each of us has to answer in five words or fewer. Today's question is, what's the race? And let's include state, federal, congressional, you know, Senate, House race you're most closely watching and why? Five words. I got it. Ohio to test conservative populism. Totally right. So Vance switches over. It looks like he's a th three to one shot. Yep. Secretary of State in Arizona. There's been much too little attention to these Secretary mm. of State races. If Mark Fincham, the uh, election denier, is elected Secretary of State, the electoral votes of Arizona will never go to a Democrat in 2024, and especially if, if Carrie Lake becomes governor. Well, Jonathan stole my thunder because it was mm -hmm. Arizona for me as well for the exact same reason. So I will say this. It's every secretary of state race where an election denier could win. 2024 democracy is in peril if any of these people win. Nevada is the other key one, right? Secretary of state race as well. I actually think these are three great answers, better than mine, but hometown favorite, better man, Oz. We are out of time. Thank you very much to John, Greg, and Tara. And thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts. And please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. You can also now subscribe to us on YouTube, where we are posting full episodes, talking books, and bonus video content. You can follow us on Twitter at TalkingFedsPod, and you can look to see our latest offerings on Patreon, where we post bonus discussions with national experts about special topics exclusively for supporters. Submit your questions to TalkingFeds.com contact, whether it's for Talking Five or general questions about the inner workings of the legal system for our sidebar segments. Thanks for tuning in, and don't worry, as long as you need answers, the feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Olivia Henriksen. Sound engineering by Matt McArdle. Rosie Don Griffin and David Lieberman are our contributing writers. Production assistance by Laurel Feldner, Kalena Tano, Emma Maynard, and David Emmett. Thanks very much to Estelle Parsons 
for explaining the different forms of presidential clemency. Our gratitude, as always, to the amazing Philip Glass, who graciously lets us use his music. Talking Fez is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later. Thank you.